Hi, I'm Stephen Lewandowski from the University of Bristol, where I'm a professor of cognitive psychology. I study how people think about global challenges, including climate change, and in particular why they sometimes reject scientific evidence. Could you give a short introduction about your paper, NASA faked the moon landing, therefore climate science is a hoax, and anatomy of the motivated rejection of science? Yes, well, this paper has caused quite a stir in certain uh, sectors of the internet. I published that about uh, two and a half years ago, and it was a survey that I posted on climate blogs where I asked uh, visitors to those blogs to come and tell me what they thought about certain things such as climate science and whether or not HIV causes AIDS or whether smoking causes lung cancer. And in addition, I asked people about a number of conspiracy theories, whether NASA faked the moon landing, whether uh, uh, Princess Diana was killed by MI5 or MI6 or whoever uh, uh, does these things. And what I found was that there was a very small but significant association between the endorsement of conspiracy theories and the rejection of climate science. And that upset certain people, I think it's fair to say. And in response, what happened was that I was bombarded with a lot of complaints. Uh, hate mail, accusations of all sorts of things, uh, fraud and ethical misconduct and you know, you name it, whatever you can imagine I was being accused of. And the university was inundated with complaints and the journal was inundated with complaints and none of which were upheld. When that happened I thought, hmm, this is very interesting because what's going on here is not the sort of standard, normal response to, to a published article in the scientific literature. And so my colleagues and I started to collect all the uh, uh, public utterances on the internet about our study and all the accusations and all the hypotheses that people advanced on the internet about our study. Um, and it turned out that the more we looked at it, the clearer it became that what was actually happening right there in real time, unfolding in front of our eyes, was just yet another instance of conspiratorial thinking. Uh, the discourse was entirely conspiratorial. Uh, the, the accusations that were leveled against us fit, you know, you could tick every single box on any criterion for conspiratorial thinking. Tick, 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 yep, yep, that's happening, that is what's going on. So we wrote another paper as a follow-up where we looked at the discourse in the, in the blogosphere and we said, well, look, guys, you know, here are the public statements. This is what people were saying. Here are the criteria for conspiratorial discourse. And guess what? You know, there is great overlap. So we published that paper as a, as a follow-up, which um, became the most as far as I, can, I know, the most ever read article ever published by that journal, I think it had something like 30,000 downloads in, you know, in two weeks, uh, uh, in, a, in a very short period of time. And out of those 30,000 people who downloaded the article, about 20 or 30, yet again, complained vociferously about uh, the article. If somebody had written something that made it appear as though my opinion was associated with conspiratorial thinking, I would have just laughed and I would have said, oh yeah, and I would have moved on. Um, but that's not what those people chose to do, and which is of course characteristic of conspiratorial thinking, because one of the things about conspiratorial thinking is that nothing happens by accident. Nothing is irrelevant. Everything has to have a very sinister purpose. And so I think the response to my papers very much confirms the obvious, which is that denial of science always invariably involves a component of conspiratorial thought. But you know, they, they sort of blanketed everybody with accusations of 
defamation, fraud, ethical violations, and so forth. Now, what happened was that um, none of those complaints were upheld by the university. They looked through everything and decided that, you know, there was no um, case to be made for, for any kind of transgression at all. They had a real issue that you were using public comments. And, and this is, it, absolutely, and this is the, 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 the thing that is very important to keep in mind in this whole situation, that um, there is this asymmetry in, in what is happening in, in public discourse, that on the one hand, anybody who runs a blog feels hubristically entitled to accuse any scientist of fraud, without any evidence, without any, I mean, nothing. You can just say that. That is just part and parcel of current internet discourse. You can say, this guy is a cheat, he's a fraud, he's doing everything wrong, etc., etc. Um, now, if a scientist then says, oh, okay, well, let's just have a look at this public discourse and let's just see what, you know, what these people are actually saying and, and, and in public, then all of a sudden, somehow that is being judged to be defamatory or libelous or whatever it is. And people, some people, not everybody, but in this case, the journal, uh, some people run for cover. Now, I think that's a serious problem because if people who make public utterances can then prevent an analysis, a scholarly analysis of their own public utterances, then I think we got a very serious problem because uh, those bloggers want to be public figures. They insist on being public figures. They take every opportunity to, to you know, show up on TV or on the radio or on blogs or in the mainstream media, trying everything to get noticed. But then all of a sudden they're saying, oh my God, no one can analyze what I'm saying in public. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. If you're a public figure, then you're responsible for what you say in public, and then your utterances are fair game for a scholarly analysis. Um, but the journal, unfortunately, um, acted otherwise, and they, in a, in a very drawn out, very intriguing and, and quite peculiar process, ultimately decided to withdraw the paper, saying, citing legal concerns. So they made it very clear that there weren't any ethical or scholarly concerns, but that there were legal issues relating to uh, presumably, you know, libel laws and threats of defamation, um, which is not entirely surprising. Um, but of course, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that they didn't uphold uh, academic freedom. And the paper is now publicly available at the University of Western Australia website and with a very clear endorsement of the university to academic freedom. Right, sure. And how much time do I have for that? Uh, we have 15 minutes. Oh dear God.